El Salvador's 12-year bloody civil war forced many of its people to escape the Central American country during the 1980s. Javier Zamora's parents were among those who fled. The 32-year-old author was a toddler when his father migrated to the United States. When he was five, his mother crossed the border, leaving Zamora in the care of his grandparents and aunts. In 1999, at the age of nine, his parents paid a network of smugglers called coyotes to bring him to their new life in California. We used the same person that brought my mom over here in 1995. And the trip is supposed to take two weeks. Instead, Zamora was left at the Guatemala-Mexico border with six strangers. The two-week journey turned into a harrowing two months. All of it is chronicled in his memoir, Solito. And I began to write from my nine-year-old voice and it just flowed. With his vivid descriptions, the reader feels Zamora's nine-year-old innocence and fears paired with adult traumas. What he endured has come with extensive therapy, which started soon after he arrived in California. The therapist would ask me a question in Spanish, and eventually I would draw a helicopter chasing me. I would draw myself in immigration detention cells. I would draw myself on this boat. This became the first time after telling my parents that I told a stranger what I had lived through. And that was therapeutic and it was necessary. And it also made it easier for me to continue my life. Everything happens fast. Handcuffs on Chino, uniforms do the same to the others who didn't run fast enough. Although he succeeded academically, his anger still raged until he found a voice through poetry. For 20 plus years, I was ashamed of that nine-year-old kid. I saw him as this defenseless, helpless child that shouldn't be in this country, or I kept on asking why did that kid live through it. Zamora's collection is called Unaccompanied. The lauded poet has been a Stegner Fellow at Stanford and a Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard, and holds fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Poetry Foundation. After spending more than three years writing this book, I've grown to love the kid and understand that he has impressive superpowers and an impressive skill to attach himself to the right people at the right time and is a great survivor. Well, Javier Zamora, welcome to St. Louis. Thank you. I'm glad you're here, because after reading Salito, my first instinct as a mother and a grandmother was to give you a big hug, and I should have done that, <laughs> because has anyone ever done that since the book's been out? A lot of people. Really? Yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. As a, you know, the maternal instinct just comes out, because and we're going to get to the hug thing a little bit later on, because you do talk a little bit about that uh, throughout your journey and your, and your memoir. So let's set the stage. You're two years old when your father leaves for the United States, and this is during the Civil War in El Salvador. And uh, you're five when your mother just comes over and crosses the border into the United States. You're left to be raised by your extended family, your aunts, your grandparents. And at the whole time, you're dreaming of being reunited with your parents, as, as you write in the book. Um, tell our audience, what is Salito? Salito is once my parents gather um, funds, and after we've tried to come here, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, for the legal w way to make it to this country, and that's not working out. We use the same person that brought my mom over here in 1995. And the trip is supposed to take two weeks, and the guy, the coyote, Don Dago, ends up leaving me and six other adults uh, at the, at the Guatemala-Mexico border. And then from then on, for the next seven weeks, we have to find different coyotes to help us and board different buses, boats, eventually leading to three tries at the Sonoran Desert. Three tries and, again, in the, yeah, of the country. Yeah, and so, so in Tolito, it's my nine-year-old self recounting the days, the nine weeks that it takes me from April 6, 1999, up until June 11, 1999, when I'm finally reunited with my parents. 
And Salito, would we translate into alone? Uh, little alone. Little alone. Yeah. What made you decide to write this memoir in your nine-year-old voice and as your nine-year-old self? Um, I was trying to write it in third person, and I was just stuck. Um, I was thinking too much about the headlines, uh, about immigration, which are ever-present almost daily. And I was also getting my, letting my adult voice get in the way of the narrative. And at the same time, I found this wonderful therapist who almost, for the first two months, we always came back to these questions. Like, what would you tell me, 29-year-old Javier, tell that nine-year-old kid? And she kept on asking this question and asking it. And eventually, she's like, why don't you write to that kid? And so Solito, that I was already trying to write in the third person, and then trying to answer that question just cracked uh, everything open. And I began to write from my nine-year-old voice, and it just flowed. So other than your grandfather accompanying you the first couple of weeks, um, he has to turn away at some point because he doesn't have all the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And we got to let our audience know, too, this isn't cheap. I mean, nowadays, I just heard an interview today for folks coming over from Honduras, for example, it's $13,000 per person. Yeah. And you're talking about poverty-stricken people. Right. So it's it's quite an investment to mm -hmm. get into this country. Um, was the same for you? Yeah, and every smuggler charges differently. Right. And there are Those different Those are the prices, coyotes that we talk about. The coyotes, about. Yeah, yeah. and it's different, usually more expensive for children. And at that time, I don't exactly know the figure, um, but it was close to the Fifteen to twelve thousand right. dollars. Yeah. So the first two weeks, her grandfather takes you as far as he can. He hands you over to Don Dago, and now you find yourself really alone. And you try to fit in with this these, these group. It's probably maybe hmm, is it about a dozen people or so at that initial spot the, time. The initial it's a group of six of us. The six. Yeah. The six. And then and then it grows as you get to different places. But among the six, you have this family, this migrant family of Chino, who's part of the group, Patricia, and then her daughter, Carla, is close to your age, Carla. Mm -hmm. um, and they protected you, and, and you developed this relationship. I found it very sweet and poignant um, as that relationship evolves, because it wasn't all touchy-feely at first. And the way you describe those feelings, have you ever imagined being reunited with him? Because I know that you there was initial uh, conversations, I guess, your parents had with him, but you've lost touch. Yeah. Would that be too, too, too traumatic if you reunited <laughs> with him? For... To 20 years, so I make it here in 1999, I'm nine years old, and I'm in contact with them for, I want to say, four weeks, because we exchange numbers, and they call almost every other day. And I remember these conversations, and then something happens, and according to my mom, they lost the number, according to my dad, they just simply stopped calling and wouldn't answer the phone, so there's uh, misremembering, yeah. uh, mix up in there. So since then, since October, September 1999, I, have, I don't know where they are. And for those 20 odd years, 20 plus years, I haven't allowed myself to, to play this scenario out. And because I don't want to get my hopes up. Yep, I get it. And, but I think it would be amazing to tell them in person, thank you. Uh, me writing this book is a huge thank you letter to them because I don't remember ever saying thank you, even when they left um, left me in, in, in Tucson and they came to the DMV area in Washington, D.C. So uh, short answer, yes, I would, I would love for that to happen. So since the book has been out, is there that in the back of your mind that do they see themselves? Because you changed names, I know, mm -hmm. to protect. But um, do you have that in the back of your mind that possibly will they see themselves? Yeah, uh, I had my second reading was in Washington, D.C., which if they've stayed there, right. that would have been the reading where I, I kept on looking yeah, I would say at, look at, in the, at audience, the crowd. Yeah. And um, since then, I, my, my hopes have gotten uh, mm -hmm. lower. But at the same time, their names and people knowing their nicknames, Chino, Carla, Patricia, can also, has also become a sort of metaphor for me you know, Chino, Patricia, and Carla all around you. And we don't really know the stories of these immigrants that are around everybody uh, every single day. 
and and now hopefully as a reader as a listener as a viewer now you stop and think about the immigrants and their stories and what they're not saying and what they've lived through so i, I have to confess um i wasn't too far into the book where i found myself kind of getting angry at your parents hmm. um how could they do this to this little boy alone a uh, boy who still hasn't quite figured out how to tie his shoes, and you have the Velcro shoes, uh, who's having to wash his own clothes. I mean, I, I know kids, little kids do not wash their own clothes. They're not, <laughs> they're not taught that. Um, so you're trying to do things that, as an adult, we take for granted. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of stepped back, and I thought, okay, these are desperate people. So they have a different mindset that I have. I, I haven't had to go through these trials and tribulations. I haven't had to escape. I, I'm a first generation American. My father came from a communist country. I know he didn't talk a lot about things that he went through. Mm -hmm. So I, that part of me kind of gets it. But I can only imagine the guilt that they must have had then. And I, you intimated a little bit at the end when they come to pick you up. Tell us about that when you finally reunite with your parents. Um. I'll, I'll talk about the guilt, okay. you know. I, the book just focuses on my trauma. Right. And for, for seven weeks, my parents didn't know where I was. And I'm not a parent myself, and I can only imagine the sort of trauma mm -hmm. that that caused them and trauma that they, have, they haven't talked to me mm -hmm. about either. And so they do carry that guilt to this day. You know, and they're still my biggest supporters. I just had readings in the Bay Area, and they were at every single reading. Um, and they, they, they love that I'm talking about it. They love my, my growth in therapy and my forgiveness. But they themselves are not believers in therapy, and I really wish that they would go to therapy and unpack all this stuff. It might be a generational thing. It, it is. It is yeah. quite the generational thing. And, and cultural, yeah. both. Yes. Both. And... The last thing I'll say is that all of us immigrants, we don't want to come or, or undertake the migration. Right. We don't want to leave everything and everybody that we know behind. And there's this weird equation that we're forced to make. And especially as a parent, you want to be with your kid. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, you want to be with your parents. That's human nature. Right. And once you let the love take over, and once you've tried other ways to bring your kid over, and that's not working, and as the violence and the poverty in your country that you left because of those said reasons are continue to get worse, you use the pool factors are stronger and stronger. And again, let me remind everybody that this was not supposed to happen. It was supposed to take less than two weeks, and things go completely. It sure does. Oh, all right. yeah. Have you had conversations with your parents about what you went through at all? I had the first initial one right after they picked me up on June 11th, uh, 1999. They took a cab from Phoenix Airport to Tucson, and that's a two-hour ride. Mm -hmm. And so for those two hours, they're just asking me questions. And I think be because of how I answered those questions, I was describing horrific things in a very normal way. These, everything that you read in Solito, right. as, as a nine-year-old, that had become my normal world. And as a parent, just listening, they were crying. Um, and so we talked then, we talked for the few weeks after, and then from the ages of nine until I'm 17, when I am this angry, angsty teenager, and I'm finally beginning to remember everything that happened in 1999, I, we have another conversation. And again, they always cry when I ask them questions. And again, I wanna say since 17, up until the writing of this book, we must have had like one or two conversations. And that's it, because it's a touchy subject. It's a subject that at times I didn't wanna talk about, and at times, for the most part, they did not want to remember you know, the anguish right. that they felt for those seven weeks when they didn't know where I was. Your writing, as I mentioned, is very vivid. Uh, a great sense of smell and sounds. Uh, mm -hmm. I found it very well described because you feel like you're going through that as the reader. You're on a, I mean, I'm gonna simplify this because it's, it's much more harrowing. You've got a buses and trucks and the harrowing boat scene. Uh, dodging cactus, that doesn't sound horrific, except you're traveling in the evening and you're dealing with the thorns and, um, which is a, is a factor. And of course, the helicopters above you. 
why were smells and sounds so important to your description of your journey? Huh. I like to say, I like to use this perhaps bad metaphor, but the trauma that I describe, I, it has felt like a 4K HD DVD that is in high definition that whenever I had nightmares or whenever I was in a similar landscape for the first time I went back to the desert, it would re-trigger and it would bring this Blu-ray DVD and put it right in front of me. And it was very vivid and I've always remembered the sounds, the taste, the way that the heat felt on my nine-year-old skin. And, and on top of that, I had a lot of research, so I moved back to Tucson in order to um, write, but also as part of exposure therapy. You know, the whole writing of this book has been this therapeutic purging that, I've, that I felt like I had to do. And so I think the more details there are as a reader and as a writer, I find it important that the reader is right there with me. <laughs> you have the opportunity to accompany yeah. this child who was alone. And in a way, it's like this trick that for myself, I had to write this book. And at the same time, I want other people to be there with me when I was just surrounded by strangers at the right. beginning. Right. And so this is, this memoir has become this therapeutic and purging of the trauma. And as I've done that, I've also began to heal right. from it because I'm literally facing it and re-traumatizing myself with the smells, with the sounds, etc. You come to the country through Tucson, now you're living there. I thought, wow, what an interesting and I didn't purpose. want I didn't want to live there. No, I'm sure I, you didn't. I just moved there uh, for research. Wow. And it turns out huh. that the desert is has been very giving yeah. and yeah. forgiving, and it's a beautiful place, yeah. Um, yeah. which I did not know. I was expecting the complete opposite. This is a place that caused me a lot of trauma, and now I'm building a life there, which yeah. is ironic. Yeah. <laughs> I also thought it was interesting. Skin color and language played a, played a role in this. I'm thinking, well, doesn't everyone speak the same Spanish if you're coming from Central America? Well, no. I guess you had to learn the different colloquialisms once you got into Mexico. It's very important in Mexico. Why is it important to assimilate when you were crossing the border uh, into Mexico to, and, and then the color of the skin? Um, and thank you for pointing that out yeah. because this is perhaps the hardest things for non-Mexican immigrants, which tend to be um, a big chunk of the people coming into this country. Um, as I'm speaking, now it's Venezuelans, uh, Cubans, and Colombians last summer. And for a lot of those summers, it has been a lot of Hondurans, Guatemalans, and Salvadorans. Right. And in order to make the trip through the 2,000 miles that Mexico entails, a lot of us are told to fake to be Mexican. Right. And, and what that means is really change the way that you speak. Um, I know to the American audience, all the Spanish might sound the same, but there are different words for different things and different accents. For example, in El Salvador and, and Honduras, we use the voceo. We say vos instead of tu right. or usted. Gotcha. Um, and and so little things like that in the everyday that could be red flags right. for uh, immigra Mexican immigration or Mexican cops, and then they stop you, and usually they steal from you, or they could deport you back, uh, yeah. depending on, right. on that I individual. As I mentioned in the introduction, you're an acclaimed poet, and your collection is called Unaccompanied. I heard you describe it in another uh, either publication or an inter interview as the gateway drug into therapy. <laughs> How, how, so? <laughs> That's a good quote. It is a good quote, and you said it. <laughs> you know, for a lot of my time in this country, I didn't have papers. I was undocumented, um, meaning that I kept on hiding. You know, I hid in Mexico, I could make it to this country, and I had to lie first. I had to assimilate, learn English, and then pretend and tell everybody that I was born in this country, which was a lie. Um, and it wasn't until I found poetry when I was 17 
and I was very angry and I was tired of lying and I was applying to colleges and I found out that I didn't qualify for any grants because of my immigration status. And so I had to work and go to UC Berkeley at the same time and had to live at home and commute to the college every day. It's a great, you know, it's a great privilege. Right. I was at UC Berkeley, great school. Right. Um, but it was poetry that really gave me that outlet and that helped me begin to answer the questions, the big questions that I had. Why am I here? Why did I suffer when I was nine years old? Why are my parents here? What really brought them over? Um, what was the war about? So all those questions, all I needed was a pen and paper and I began to write them. Of course, poetry is, is, can't fix you. It's not the only uh, method to healing, but they wouldn't, I wouldn't have gotten into therapists or found the therapist that I have now without that gateway drug. So it was a, a small stepping stone in this healing path that I'm on. And the therapist that you ended up really connecting with was, wasn't she, come, come, did she come over the border the same way? or how, uh, No, she, she came differently. Okay. Uh, she's Dominican. Oh, Dominican. Okay. And she came here as a child herself. Right. I want to say she must have been six. Yeah. yeah. So she could relate to that that little person that, you know, coming over, maybe yeah. not to the extent that you did, but yeah. that's so fascinating. And I could me. trust her, too. Right. It was very important for me. I've had therapists since seventh grade because I was a... Uh, a very angry student, yeah. uh, academically great student, but not behaviorally. That surprised me because it didn't come out in the book. Because you talk about back in El Salvador, you always talk about a great student to the fact to the point that you felt like um, you weren't with the cool kids because yeah. you were the nerdy smart one. Yeah. Basically, is how you describe yourself. Yeah. Um, so well, that was pre uh, hormones. Okay. Once the hormones kicked <laughs> in, that I was yeah. I was angry yeah. student. Yeah. You know. And I get that. Yeah. And then you're older enough to ask these questions because, mm -hmm. you know, to, to form those. In fact, speaking of school, you write about your mother telling you that education was the way out. She really instilled that in you. Uh, how did that mindset carry over to you in the United States? You know, she is the type of mother that would sit me down in front of a blackboard and taught me to hold the chalk when I was three years old. I, I knew how to read and write before all the other children in preschool. And that work ethic translated into, you know, I came here during the summer, right before fourth grade. And every single day before school, she had me learn 10 words of English. And by the time that school started in late August, I already knew a lot of English words. And I was put into an ELL classroom that I translated at, or I graduated out of in, I want to say, less than two months. Wow. So after two months, I was almost a fluent speaker. Wow. And, and that's my mom's doing and my dad's uh, doing as well. And as a kid, I think I understood that like, oh, education is gonna be the thing like it always has been. I've never paid for school. I went to a private school in El Salvador, but because I was the valedictorian, I never had to pay. And in the United States, I've had a similar experience as well. I go to a private high school that I have, I pay like $100 a year when the other children are paying a lot more. So, so many things help you. Also, I find out now, I'm speaking to you before the interview, that when you get back to the States post and your nine-year-old self still, you started a journal. Mm -hmm. I find that fascinating. So you were starting to put things on, on paper, whether it's drawings or not, at, at nine years old. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a journal. Okay. I, I would call it a... Uh, a therapeutic book. Okay. Uh, by that I mean that in California in 1999, and this was a new program, that every recent arrival, because there were a lot of us, I wasn't the only child immigrating in the right. 90s. Right. Um, I remember in my classroom, there were in my grade, there were nine. And all of us were made to meet with the school therapist once a week, over 15 weeks. And over those 15 weeks, I, at first I would just draw and occasionally the therapist would ask me a question in Spanish. And eventually I would draw a helicopter chasing me. I would draw myself in immigration detention cells. I would draw myself on this boat. Mm -hmm. And this became the first time that after telling my parents that I told a stranger what I had lived through. And that was therapeutic. 
and it was necessary. And it also made it easier for me to continue my life. It was like, okay, I told my story, it's in this book, I can put that book away and I can forget about it and go, go along being a normal right. nine-year-old kid. I've carried this book with me every single place that I've moved to. And it's my most prized possession, but rarely did I open it because it was too close to home. Mm. And so I wouldn't call it a journal. It was, it was this thing that I did with this stranger for 15 continuous weeks. And it, she titled it Javier's Journey. Mm -hmm. And that is the first book that I ever wrote. Wow. Yeah. After writing Salido, do you understand your nine-year-old self better? Yes. Um, for 20 plus years, I was ashamed of that nine-year-old kid. I saw him as this defenseless, helpless child that um, shouldn't be in this country. Or I kept on asking, why did that kid live through it? After spending more than three years writing this book, I've grown to love the kid and understand that he has impressive superpowers and an impressive skill um, to attach himself to the right people at the right time and is a great survivor. Yeah. And I did not use that word before writing this book. I think it's also a word that all of us immigrants need to uh, use more often mm -hmm. because once I began to use that word and see myself and this nine-year-old kid as a survivor, it has unlocked a lot of love yeah. and appreciation uh, for this kid. Yeah. What is your hope for Salido? Who, what, what do you hope for immigrants, migrants, naturalized citizens to get out of this? Everybody. I hope it's a conversation starter. Um, a conversation starter for us immigrants who have lived and gone through similar experiences. For the longest, I never saw other people talk about what they have gone through. And hopefully, me doing this with the help of my wife, who is a Reiki practitioner, with, with the help of medication, with the help of um, meditation, with the help of my therapist, and that I've embarked on this, and hopefully me embarking on this makes it okay for other survivors to begin to have that internal conversation with themselves. For non-survivors, I hope and that the next time that you look at an immigrant or think of an immigrant, now you know at least four of them. You know me, you know this face, you know Chino, yeah. you know Patricia, you know Carla, yeah. and you know their names. And maybe that makes you look at us differently, hopefully with a little bit more empathy. Yeah. And, and that could also be the beginning of better conversations than the ones that we're having now. So you've got your collection of poetry, Javier, the memoir, and you're touring now. So what's next after this? Or is that just too much to think about right uh, now? <laughs> too much to think about. Um, but I eventually want to write about what it's like to grow up as an undocumented kid who has to keep that identity hidden from himself and from everybody else. So the angry book is coming. <laughs> and that would be a good one. Your, your yeah. days here, the early days in the United States, yeah. really. Yeah. Well, for you, you're so, you're so young. But <laughs> why couldn't this be optioned to a movie, or have you been approached? Oh. <laughs> it would make a heck of a movie. It would. It would if you're... If the directors are watching, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it happening. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Javier Zamora. Thank you so much for the beautiful writing, truly. Again, uh, full disclosure, I stayed up all night reading it because it just captivated me and moved me so much. But I want to give you that hug now. Right. I thought I was going to do that. I did that when you came in. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I feel like I know you. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate yeah. it. And all the, the writings are beautiful. So yeah. good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. The moon paints the waves platinum. The moon and the stars reflect on the water like jellyfish. Large tentacles reaching toward Asia. The stars' reflections on the water like tortillas on the comal. The mortars are louder than every other sound. Rrrr. Our noses feel like someone stuck two gasoline-dipped cotton balls in our nostrils. A few people have finally given in to sleep. 
They don't sit on the bench for fear of tipping over if there's a big wave. Instead, they're crunched up on the ground, wearing their backpacks to cushion the bumps. I try not to think about my nervousness by looking over the man's heads across from us, trying to spot a light, any light, to signal that we're close to the coast, but everything is dark over the side where the moon rose from. It's almost full. Over there is Mexico, I whisper to me and only me. But there are no lighthouses, no islands, no other boats. No one has spoken in hours. Not even the coyotes have said anything, not even rotate. It's silent except for the sound of the mortars, of the waves, and the boats that still follow us. We can hear their mortars fainter than ours, but they're there.